Next up, uh, from uh, starting at well, right about now, um, we've got one of our longer 50, 50 minute talks. And I am very happy to introduce you all to Pim Trarbach, who is going to be uh, giving a talk called Smoke Loader, the Pandora's Box of Tricks, Payloads, and Anti-Analysis. He's a reverse engineer. So everyone give a big welcome to Pim. Can you all hear me okay? Cool, all right. All right, so quick introduction to myself. Uh, my name is Pim. I am a reverse engineer at Proofpoint. Uh, my main focus is on equine botnets, so things like uh, Emotet, Qbot, IceID, um, and so on. But every once in a while, I'll get the uh, random APT request where I'll be asked to reverse engineer some nation state uh, Trojans and whatnot. Um, I'm a member of the Crypto Lamus team, so for those of you that don't know what that is, it's a team of roughly 25 researchers all around the world where we, for the last three or four years, have been fighting the botnet Emotet. Um, and I've done a mix of reverse engineering for them and software development to do automated malware processing. Um, my background is in computer science. I got a degree from Lewis and Clark uh, in computer science. Um, and my first job out of college was a software development role. And I had a deep interest in malware at the time, but I didn't have any formal training on reverse engineering. Um, so I kind of wanted to combine those two things, and I started to get pretty good at reverse engineering, and I also really enjoyed writing code. So the, for me, the kind of nice blend of these two was network protocols, and specifically malware network protocols. So that's kind of what I specialize in for malware analysis. And there's my Twitter and GitHub. Okay, so for the agenda today, we'll be talking about, uh, we'll be going into the history of Smoke Loader, and we'll be getting into the first stage, then we'll analyze the, set, the final stage, and then I'll talk about how I actually achieved uh, fully static config extraction for this malware family. We'll be going into the communication protocol that it uses to communicate with the command and control, and then we will talk about the payloads that I actually received from this botnet. So what exactly is Smoke Loader? Uh, smoke Loader is a piece of malware that is classified as a loader. And this basically means that its entire job is to deliver additional malware. So you can kind of think of it like the uh, UPS system where people can just send malware through it. Um, it, it first appeared in 2014. It targets solely Windows. Um, it's around a 30 kilobyte um, payload, which is pretty small. Uh, generally, you see them around like 100 to 150 to 200. Um, and this malware is actually written in C and assembly. Now, pure assembly is not something you really see in malware too much, uh, but in this case, which I'll get into later, they actually had to do a good chunk of this development in assembly. Um, so while Smoke Loader is a loader, it has additional plugins that kind of extend its capabilities. So that'll be for data exfiltration and just additional um, actions on objective and whatnot. Um, and from a reverse engineering perspective, people really like to reverse engineer Smoke Loader because it's highly obfuscated. There's things that Smoke Loader does that uh, people don't see in other malware families. Um, and since it, was, since it first came out in 2014, it actually has had continued development throughout its life cycle. So um, they generally have around a update every year or two where they add additional features. Um, the entire package, if you wanted to purchase the panel, uh, a bot, and all the plugins and everything, it would run you about $1,600. Um, and what's interesting here is there is a check where it um, makes sure that the uh, machine that it's infected is not a Russian machine. And this is something that you cannot remove. This is like hard coded within the bot. Everything else you can modify, but this is a check that um, is not allowed to be bypassed. And finally, this is a multi-stage malware. So um, it, it has that first stage, and then if everything goes well with the first stage, then it will get onto the final stage of the malware. Wow, that does not look good. Um, <laughs> all right, this talk might be tough with some of these diagrams. Um, but this is basically the listing that they have on the forum where smoke loader is being sold. You can go and uh, see what they're actually, what they're advertising and what modules they have. And it's really nice from a reverse engineering perspective when you can just go and see what features they have. It makes my job a little bit easier. Okay, so the current set of plugins that smoke loader actually has is a form grabber. And this is advertised as really just stealing credentials that are sent in HTTP post requests and whatnot. Um, I'm not sure the efficacy of how any of these work. I haven't reverse engineered these plugins. Then it has a password sniffer, which is just going to uh, sniff, sniff the network traffic for like FTP credentials and 
various other credentials, the low-hanging fruit. Um, and then it has a remote PC, which basically acts as team viewer, so it's not something where they have like their own session, they actually join the session of the user. And then they have a fake DNS plugin, so if you wanted to redirect all traffic from google.com to, to your own IP, you can do that. Uh, this doesn't work with SSL, so it's just purely HTTP traffic. Um, and then for, they have a file search module, so you can basically give it a regex, and it will find all the files that match on the host, and then send them back. And then it has a procmon module, which was kind of interesting. Um, procmon is generally a tool that people will use for incident response and whatnot, but in this case, they actually use it to, they can basically define events and actions to happen when specific processes are created. And then they have a DDoS module, a standard key logger, and then the email grabber, which is just going to steal the Outlook address book and whatnot. So how is Smoke Loader actually used? Let's say I was in the market and I wanted to buy a botnet. I wanted to start my own, but I don't have the dev skills to write my own. So I'm gonna see this Smoke Loader and it's, I decide that it's the one that I wanna purchase. So uh, basically I'm gonna get the C2 panel, a bot, and all the modules. And I set up my panel and I start infecting machines. Let's say somehow I was able to infect 300, 400, 500 machines. Um, then I can go to all my friends and be like, hey, do you guys have malware that you want to deliver to all these machines that I have infected? And they'll be like, heck yeah, why not? And I can basically say, well, if I'll install um, your malware to 100 machines for $100. So it's basically this, as I mentioned before, it's really this delivery network. And you can have a single bot that is tasked to deliver 50 plus malware samples with just, with, with just its initial uh, check into the command and control. So this process is generally referred to as selling loads. Um, so the other big malware in this family of loaders is going to be private loader, basically does the same thing where they sell a service for uh, installing your malware X amount of times. But this model has flaws. It's something that's kind of used by lower or mid-tier criminals um, because a lot of these hosts that are infected, they're infected with like 30, 40 different remote access trojans, info stealers. Uh, so you really have cases where they're all exfiltrating the same set of credentials over and over that people have seen for the last 10 years. So the data you're actually getting is not gonna be very valuable, but if you just need like raw compute power for DDoS or stuff, um, then I guess this could be a, a viable botnet to use. Okay, so now we'll get into the operational model. So let's say I'm the admin and I have a couple partners. From the command and control server, I'm able to send the following to the smoke loader bot. I can send the plugins if I purchase them. I can send uh, actual raw executables. I can send executables that are encrypted with RC4. And I can actually send URLs that point to clear text executables. So it's a way for instructing the bot to download payloads from uh, remote servers, basically. So in the actual listing of the smoke loader forum post, they actually say you have to crypt the panel. They specifically say like this is not FUD, like this is a sample that you need to like uh, pack basically. So for those that don't know, uh, packing is basically, if you were to think of your malware sample as a onion, you just add another layer to it of encryption or compression or something. Um, and this is basically to defeat basic antivirus and things like virus total checks and so on. So. Let's say we have a packed smoke loader sample, and that's the sample that actually lives on disk here. So then that is gonna get unpacked to our smoke loader, our initial stage of smoke loader. And then if all the checks pass in that stage, then we are finally going to get within memory the uh, unpacked final smoke loader stage. Okay, so with this understanding of this botnet and having me talk with a bunch of other friends and them saying like, oh, well, smoke loader, you know, it like delivers tons of payloads, it would be really cool uh, to see what they're actually delivering. I was like, well, like I have access to a bunch of malware feeds, but what if I want to basically turn this delivery network of uh, infections into a delivery network of intelligence data, basically? Like I wanted to, turn smoke loader on its head and really turn it into a passive intelligence gathering tool. So this is the process that I came up with. So there is a stage one for smoke loader, the initial stage, that is going to decompress the final stage of smoke loader. And then from that we need to extract all the configuration details, so the command and control servers, the encryption keys, the versions and whatnot. 
And then we need to understand the network protocol because we need to be able to write a client for this botnet that can communicate with the command and control without actually causing infections. We basically just want to save off all the payloads that were sent. So now we'll get into the analysis of smoke loader stage one. So stage one is really where all the interesting obfuscation of the malware lives. Um, the functionality of this is really just to check if the host is a viable victim for the botnet. Um, so it checks the locale of the machine just to make sure it's not, it doesn't have like a Cyrillic keyboard or something like that. It checks for uh, sandbox artifacts, virtualization processes, and then if all those checks pass, it's going to decrypt and decompress the actual bot. Um, now some of the main obfuscation techniques that Smoke Loader uses are going to be uh, opaque predicates, and then it actually has this technique called runtime function decryption, and a, a, a slew of other uh, anti-disassembly tricks. That's not great either. Okay. Um, so getting into opaque predicates, I just wanted to give a quick introduction to what those are. So in the top, we have our incorrect disassembly. So for those that can't see, there's basically an instruction that is a jump not zero, and it points to uh, location X in memory. And then there is a jump zero instruction, which points to the same location X. Now, as humans, we can see that a jump not zero and a jump zero is going to cover all of your cases. It's basically like if you were to write code, if you had a conditional that said if true, else if false. Like, it's a condition that is always going to happen. So we can easily see that this jump is always going to be taken. But disassemblers can't realize this. They don't, they don't have the ability to process this uh, Boolean logic. So the disassembler takes the byte immediately after that jump zero and starts disassembling from there. But that's actually the, the incorrect implementation. So in the bottom, we have the correct disassembly where I told the disassembler, don't disassemble from this location, disassemble from this one. So that's where we can actually see in the bottom here, it's doing a uh, pop ECX and then doing a jump. That is actually the correct uh, flow. And this is not something that is going to have any effect on the malware. It's not going to slow it down or um, cause any issues with its execution. This is purely just to make the lives of reverse engineers more difficult. Yikes. Okay. Um, so now we have the runtime function decryption. So basically, all the functions that are of interest to Smoke Loader, it encrypts their function bodies. So normally when you have your source code, let's say you're writing a Python application, you have your function call, and then you can just read the source code and see what's happening. Smoke Loader doesn't allow you to do that. So basically what it does is when it's calling a function that it, it has deemed important, or basically 80% of its functions are encrypted, um, it gets a reference to its current uh, instruction pointer, and it gets the size that it needs to uh, decrypt or encrypt. And then when the function is called, it will decrypt the rest of the body. And then at the end, we actually have another call that will encrypt the rest of the body back up. So from a static analysis perspective, this makes the malware really tough to look at because you're not going to be, look at valid, you're not going to be looking at valid assembly instructions. You're going to be looking at encrypted code. So the only way to really statically reverse engineer smoke loader is to add additional scripting on top of it. So how does smoke loader actually implement that? So in the bottom here, um, on the decryption results, we actually have a function that I threw in Ida Pro's uh, decompiler after I did a bunch of work to decrypt the function body. And you can see at the top there, they have the decrypt code body call. And then the rest of that code is basically what I was able to, to decrypt. And then at the end, they have another call to decrypt code body, which in this case actually encrypts the rest of the body back up. So even if you were to take a uh, memory jump of smoke loader, you would never have a snapshot in, in time where all the functions were decrypted. Um, so you really have to go the Python approach and manually uh, parse these function bodies. So in the case of smoke loader, it does this by XORing the body with a single byte XOR key. So in this case, they use EF. Um, so the next thing they do that I found interesting was they have a way to uh, get obscure string references. So they have a call instruction here that does a call to location 402246. And that basically does a jump to uh, the address after these strings. Now for those that don't know, a call instruction in assembly, what it really does is it pushes the following address onto the stack and then it does a jump. That's all a call instruction does. 
But immediately after they do this call instruction, they have a pop into the, the ESI register. So it's basically giving ESI the address of that SBIE DLL, which is the sandboxy DLL. It's a common tool that people can use for analyzing Windows processes and malware. So this is just one way that they uh, references reference strings indirectly, and this also actually breaks disassembly and uh, the IDA Pro decompiler. So just another thing to make static reverse engineering more difficult. So now getting into the actual execution flow of what stage one does. So the first check that it does is it checks if there's a debugger attached, and it does this by reading the uh, process environment block, which I'll talk about later. Um, and then it loads two DLLs, kernel 32 and user 32. And if it detects that it has a Cyrillic keyboard, then the malware will exit. But if that check passes, it's going to load uh, ADV API 32 and shell 32. And then it actually does something interesting. It takes NTDLL, which is kind of your main uh, Windows DLL, your lowest level DLL, and it copies it to the temp directory and loads it from there. And this is a technique that malware uses to evade uh, EDR systems because EDR systems commonly look to see if NTDLL is being loaded directly so, so, so that they can place their hooks into the functions. Um, so in this case, it's an attempt to bypass that. Um, and then they have some basic checks just to see the check its own file name. So if you, like if it's sample.bin or virus.bin or something, the malware is not going to execute. And then it checks if there are DLLs loaded within its own process uh, that relate to sandbox. And then it checks if there are uh, VM processes run. So it checks for like VirtualBox, Parallels, um, VMware, and so on. And then finally, if all those checks happen, it has a uh, a if statement basically where it will, if the host is a 64-bit system versus a 32-bit system, then it will decrypt and decompress the 64-bit payload. Otherwise, it will do the 32-bit payload. So now, if we were to think about this smoke loader initial stage in memory, it's basically broken up into three chunks. So we have the top chunk being our smoke loader stage one. Then our second chunk is going to be our 32-bit uh, final stage, and then the final bit is going to be our 64-bit. So how does Smoke Loader actually extract this final stage within itself? So it decrypts it with a four-byte XOR key, which I have in the Python implementation there, and then it actually uses an algorithm uh, called LZSA to decompress. Now, for those that know things about uh, compression algorithms, they're incredibly difficult to implement. Um, and I was actually able to find an implementation of this uh, decompression algorithm, but it's in a raw assembly, which makes it kind of difficult, because you can't really call that from any Python bindings, and you can't really, there's no C implementation, no nothing. So it makes analysis even more difficult there. But let's say we were able to decrypt and decompress our payload, and now we have our final stage of smoke loader. So the final stage. Uh, this is basically what the final stage looks like in a hex editor. Now, if you notice, there is no PE header. So this is not a valid uh, Windows executable. So how does this load? Well, basically, it, uh, it functions as shell code. So it's position-independent code where it needs to be able to resolve its own access. Because normally when you have a Windows executable, you can rely on the Windows loader that is going to properly load your executable in memory and make sure that you can make all the function calls that you need to make. With shell code, you don't have that. Uh, feature, basically. So uh, this final stage needs to be able to resolve those things all by itself. So the main thing, or the main features that this final stage really has is just C2 communications and to inject and deliver, or to inject and receive these payloads. That's all it really does at the end of the day. So since this is shell code, or effectively shell code, um, it needs to initialize its main client. So it needs a couple things that it, or there's a couple things that it has to do that normally you would rely on the uh, Windows loader for. So it needs to find the correct DLL handle, so this basically gives it access to the libraries that it needs. And then from those libraries, it needs to figure out the functions that it wants to call. So it needs to be able to find all those addresses for functions. And then finally, it needs um, IPs and domains to communicate with because it needs to check into the C2 to get its, its list of tasks. Uh, and then we, it, it, it needs the ability to gather host information. And in this case, that information is sent to the command and control server, where then the admin of the panel is able to filter their bots by the various information that has been sent. OK. so. 
how does it actually, so how is the smoke loader sample actually able to do this? Well, it reads something called the PEB, or the process environment block. And it's this structure that is present within all Windows processes. Um, and there's, and normally it's really for like additional metadata and debugging purposes. But in this specific case, malware authors love it for this one particular field, this LDR field here. And that's basically a pointer to another struct. And that struct is this smaller one on the your right. Um, and that basically has a list of all the DLLs that are loaded within the Windows process. So as you're unpacking your malware samples, this basically gives you access to a bunch of DLLs where you wouldn't have to, or where um, normally you would have to do a bunch of math to try and figure out how to uh, call these functions and stuff. But, nor but in this case, they can just rely on the in-memory order module list to get handles to DLLs. So on the right here, or your right, um, we can see that they're accessing the PEB, and then they're, load, they're accessing the LDR field, or member, and then the in load order module list. So this loop that they're doing here, this do while loop, is basically their way of hashing the DLL's name. So this is a common technique that malware uses where it basically can store references to strings and to, um, yeah, just, just strings. Um, without having to place the string within the sample itself, because let's say uh, it had the string um, x64 debug or something in there. Um, you wouldn't want to put that within your sample, because then just from looking at the strings of the sample, you can see, well, okay, well, maybe it's looking for a debugger, so maybe I don't use that specific debugger. Uh, but in this case, they generate a hash, and then they XOR it with a four byte value. And if that value equals this C3FD16DD, uh, then they know that they found the handle for NTDLL, and they know that they can uh, preserve that and use that for later purposes. And that is the actual hashing algorithm that Smoke Loader uses. I think this is pretty consistent across all the versions. Um, but at this point, it has found the uh, DLL handle for NTDLL in kernel 32. And then from there, it has these functions, which I've named resolve imports into struct, where it takes the handles to those DLLs, along with an array of API hashes, basically just hashes of function names. And it will iterate over all the functions in the DLL, hash them, and if it matches the given hash, then it saves that address to its own structure. So it does this for user 32, ADV API, uh, OLE 32, WinHTTP, and uh, DNS API. So the bot is basically initialized at this point. Um, there are two things that it does before it actually returns to uh, making communications and processing payloads. It creates two threads um, where they basically check for malware analysis processes. And they use the same hashing algorithm that I listed earlier to basically iterate over all the list of running processes and all the window names of all the um, processes. And then they hash those, and if they match any of the given hashes, then they know that they're that a malware analyst is trying to look at their malware sample. So they quit execution there. So if you're ever debugging um, smoke loader and it just randomly quits on you, this, this, this might be why. So you might want to patch out these create thread calls. OK, so now that the client is initialized, um, we need to talk about the network communications, how the bot actually sends the data that it gathers to the command and control server and what data is actually sent. So the bot will send the version of Smoke Loader. So they, I mentioned earlier they basically have a uh, one update every year. And the version is just going to be uh, the given year. And this version is actually the first thing that is checked within the um, Respond, or on, on the C2 panel as well as the bot side. And if that value doesn't match, then it discards the rest of the uh, packet. And then it's going to send a 41-byte bot ID, which is basically a concatenation of host information. And effectively, for my purposes, I just set this to a random string just so that I never got any, so that they couldn't block me by bot ID. Um, and then you have a host name, which in this case, they have a max value of a 16-byte string. Again, I just set this to a random value. And then we have the affiliate ID. So this is the field that is extremely important. So let's say I purchased Smoke Loader and I set up my botnet. I would name my botnet PIM or something. Um, then basically, every bot that checks in needs to have that affiliate, uh, the affiliate ID of PIM. Um, and I, if it's not that value, then I know that it's a bad bot or that it shouldn't be connecting to my system or it's just not going to get any payloads. So you really have to make sure that if you are extracting the configuration of Smoke Loader that you're able to extract this affiliate ID because it 
greatly uh, influences how many payloads you get. And then it sends the user's privilege just to see if the user is admin. Um, and then it sends the Windows version. So Smoke Loader actually has support for three commands. Now botnets, they all have support for commands. Um, and they generally will have uh, five to 10 commands or something. But Smoke Loader only has three. And they are really just um, for the purposes of uh, modifying the final stage. So they have I, which stands for install persistence. They have R, which stands for remove or uninstall. So if you send them like a bad packet or something, you might get a R response back. That was something that I actually dealt with when developing my uh, smoke loader client. And then U is actually a update. So if the admin of the botnet um, buys the new update or new year's version, uh, you'll see this command to tell your bot to update to 2022 or something. Whoopsies. Um, okay, so now that we've analyzed stage two, we need to figure out how to extract the configuration from Smoke Loader. Um, so I really wanted to, um, actually wait, so we have to be able to extract the final stage from the initial Smoke Loader stage. And I didn't want to rely on any sandboxes because I just wanted to be able to do this all statically and throw a thousand plus samples at my code and just be given the uh, final stage. So I mentioned earlier that for LZSA there is no source code implementation, but in this case I actually used the CP or the assembly instructions within Smoke Loader itself to decompress the final stage. So I used something called a CPU emulator. In this case I used Unicorn, um, and it basically allows you to define a start address and an end address, and as long as you set your arguments correctly, uh, it will basically decompress the payload um, without me having to write source code for it. So I know that this function in assembly is going to decompress. I just have to set up the correct arguments, and then I can basically wrap it in Python bindings, and then I have this nice little uh, Python function that can decompress uh, the final stage. So at this point, we're able to take 1,000 plus samples, and we can easily uh, figure out the XOR key, and we can decompress the final stage. So what actually constitutes a smoke loader configuration? So this JSON blob here is basically how I organize all of my configurations. I extract configurations from multiple malware families. Um, I will generally have a family field in there where I can easily figure out what the malware family actually is. Um, and then we have our list of C2s. Um, and then we, uh, Smoke Loader actually has two encryption keys for network communication. So it has one key that is used to encrypt data going to this command and control server. And then it has another key that's used for decrypting data uh, from the command and control server. And then we have that affiliate ID and the version. And with just this information, you have everything you need to create your own smoke loader bot and to start a new, uh, a new bot. So how do we actually extract these encryption keys? So for some of these like mid-tier or kind of lower tier malware families, the way that they actually work is when they have a bot builder, it's not like they're putting in the new command and control servers into the source code and then compiling everything and doing it that way. Basically, they take the compiled code and they strip out where the command and control servers are, where the encryption keys are, and they save those as variables. And then when they go to build a new bot, when you pass those fields in, it will basically just copy paste them into the uh, raw binary itself. So this means for our analysis, it makes extraction very easy because offsets for things aren't gonna change. Um, they're, they're not gonna change uh, bytes for assembly instructions. So in that case, I actually was able to use regex, which uh, I'll get into here. So this is the Python code that I actually use to extract the encryption key. So we define our regex. Now, people generally use regex for uh, strings and whatnot, but there's nothing stopping you from using it for assembly instructions. Um, and then we iterate over all the matches for that regex, and then we unpack them with the correct NDNS, and we append it to our list and return the list. Now. I never had a case here where I got more than one result. So I guess that's just showing that this technique can be really valuable when you have these like template builder malware families. Um, and then we can do the same thing for version extraction. We identify where the version is stored or referenced within the assembly instructions. And then we create a regex based off that, iterate over all the matches. Then we can do some light checking. In this case, I just make sure it's a value that's not over 0x uh, FFFF. Uh, I should really just do the year, 
Um, but this approach works extremely well for the final stage. Like I don't think I encountered, I think I processed 200, 300 samples and I didn't, didn't have a single one where I wasn't able to extract this information. So now for the command and control servers for this malware, the way it works is they have a global uh, array, basically, of string pointers, or byte pointers, basically, where each one is going to be a offset to a encrypted command and control server. So it iterates over that global list of command and control uh, pointers, and it reads the first value, and that's going to be the length of the command and control server, and then it reads the next four bytes, and that's going to be your RC4 key to decrypt the command and control server. And then finally, we can RC4 with that four byte key, and we can uh, RC4 uh, decrypt uh, the uh, length that we extracted earlier, and then from there we have our command and control. So in Smoke Loader, um, they, they use anywhere from two to 10 C2s from what I've seen. They either have a pattern of, in this case, they used host, file, host, and then some random number. Uh, they follow that pattern a lot where it'll be a concatenation of three words and then a random number at the end, or they'll just go full, uh, just random string mode and just have like six different domains in there that are all random strings. So putting this all together, um, I wrote a bunch of code that could um, find all these uh, these obfuscation techniques, strip them out from the binary, um, decrypt all the function bodies, and decompress the final stage. And it does this all statically. So hopefully, aha. So it found a bunch of opaque predicates here, and I actually patched those bytes out, so it makes it really nice and easy to look at smoke loader in a disassembler. And then we identify all of the uh, function calls where it goes to decrypt the function body, decrypt all of those, and then we identify the start and end address of the 64-bit and 32-bit payloads, and then we're able to decrypt and decompress the final stage. And then from that, we can run our config extraction, which is the output here in JSON. Uh, and this is something that I'll open source, so if people want ideas for how to do uh, more complex config extraction, they can use this as a reference or whatever. Okay, so now we basically have this pipeline where we're able to take uh, stage one smoke loader samples and extract configurations from fully statically, uh, so we don't have to rely on any sandboxes or anything. So now we need to actually implement the bot of smoke loader. So for the data that gets sent to the C2, uh, this is the clear text data that's actually sent. Um, the packet gets encrypted with that four byte RC4 key that I mentioned in the uh, JSON configuration. But the first value it sends is going to be the version. And this is the first thing that the malware checks. If this value is off at all, it discards the rest of the packet. So if you wanna do any fuzzing or any sort of like um, just analysis of the network protocol, you have to make sure that you understand the network protocol so that it's not just gonna discard all of your data that you're sending to it. Um, but then we have our bot ID. In this case, I just used, again, just a random string. We have our computer name, just set it to a random string. Then you have your affiliate ID, which is the only field that really has to be set correctly. And then we have our Windows version. In this case, I was pretending to be a Windows 10 machine. And then we have our WinBit. I think that's, I don't actually know what that one is. And then the uh, bot's privilege level. So this is basically the uh, privilege level of the user that executed the process. And then we have our command ID, our command option, and our command results. So those are the three fields that are going to change throughout the packets that we send to the command and control server. Everything else, fully static. You can just hard code those in there throughout the entirety of the bot's lifetime. And then finally, there's, um, it, it, it appends the packet with random data, or it's going to be data that's being exfiltrated. So then for the response packet, it's the same kind of thing where the first two bytes are going to be the version and it checks, the bot also makes the same check where if it's not that value then it uh, discards the rest of the packet and then it actually sends a two byte value that is gonna correspond to a, uh, a, a number. So in this case, this corresponds to 48 and this basically tells the bot there are 48 tasks for you to download, make 48 requests to download it and then you'll get a payload back. 
And then we have this hard-coded separator here. And finally, we have this plugin string where it basically is a plugin underscore size equals blank. And if that value is not zero, then it is going to, or then the rest of the data in this packet is going to be all the plugins when they're encrypted. And it basically instructs the bot that, hey, there are plugins that you need to process. So how does this actually look over the wire? Um, I set up my client and I let it run and captured some traffic in Wireshark. Um, so in this case, everything is made through post requests to Slash and then they have the encrypted RC4 packet. But if we look at the response, it's actually returning a 404. So this is something that you have to keep in mind when dealing with malware systems is they aren't gonna follow like standard practices of like if it's a valid response, return a 200 or something. I think within the bot, they actually check to ensure that it returns a 404 before it starts processing the rest of the data. So this is just to keep in mind that malware systems are not, they don't have to abide by the same rules that standard developers do. So now we need to get into the order of communications that the malware needs to send. So we start off with that 10001 command, which basically puts us in the botnet panel. So at that point, we are a live bot, and we've incremented the number of bots that this bot master has. And it's going to tell us, you need to pull uh, 48 uh, tasks. So we make a bunch of requests. We send the command 10002 which basically will return the, uh, the specific tasks that we need to inject or write to disk or in some form or another execute. And then we need to confirm back to the command and control server that yes, this actually worked. Uh, we properly installed this malware. And then the actual, like I mentioned earlier, that, it, that this process is basically called selling loads. So then it will actually increment the loads counter and say yes, that is another uh, uh, load for this actor. So proof of concept, um, I wrote a bot for smoke loader in Go. Um, and I set up my own command and control server here. And basically what it's doing is I basically said, hey, there is a, oopsies. Um, here we initialize our bot. So we're basically uh, registering the bot with the command and control. And in my panel, I had it say, there is a payload at google.com or twitter.com. And then I put it at a actual uh, payload that is being uh, sent to smoke loader bots. So at this point, um, I have a fully working bot where we're able to pull tasks and dump them to disk with various metadata. And we can confirm back that yes, this wasn't exactly, or this was installed when in fact it wasn't. But the plugins, I have yet to address the plugins. So I'll kind of going, or I'll be going over now what the structure of these plugins is and how to parse them. It's not something that I really saw people talk about anywhere. Um, so if anyone's looking at Smoke Loader and this helps you, then great. So there are two structures for the plugins. Um, the main one is going to be this Smoke Plugin container, which is that bottom one there. And basically, when the bot registers with the command and control, it sends back, if there are plugins, it returns back a blob of RC4 encrypted data. Now, that data is basically this smoke plugin container. It contains information about how many plugins there are, um, and then it basically goes into a loop for processing all the plugins. So the first value for the actual plugin itself which is this top struct here, is it gives the size of the plugin and then a 15 byte RC4 key, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, you don't generally see 15 byte RC4 keys, they'll generally keep it like 16 or 32 or something. Um, and they actually use that RC4 key to decrypt the plugin and inject it into memory. Um, now these plugins, um, I didn't get a chance to reverse engineer them because it's kind of the same format as the final stage of Smoke Loader where um, there is no valid header to it, so it makes it kind of a pain to analyze, and I just didn't have enough time. Um, but now we were able to implement our bot, and we were able to pull payloads. So now we're kind of in the stage where we need to set up an environment where we can passively pull payloads and gain that intelligence from this botnet. So for the setup, um, I set up a Raspberry Pi under my desk about 10 months ago. Um, the, bat, the, bot gather, or the, the bot gathered configurations from various sources, it would register with the command and control server, make the appropriate amount of download requests where we would get a bunch of payloads. Those would be written to disk, and then we could post-process them uh, later. 
So some caveats here. I did not run the bots for very long. I basically let the bot register with the command and control, and I went through that first loop of tasks to pull. So I never ran a bot for, I think, more than five minutes. Um, I never switched any uh, geolocations or used any proxies of any kind. Everything was just done from my uh, apartment here in Portland. So I'm sure my, my IP appears in a bunch of smoke loader panels right now. Um, and I randomized data, but I didn't make it look believable. Like, I didn't have like actual names in the username or actual uh, host information in the host name. So uh, that was something I probably could have done better. But I wrote all this information out from all these payloads into a CSV. Um, and that's basically what we're seeing there in the screenshot. So some results, I get that that's really small, so I'll just read them out. Uh, but over an eight month period, I captured 10,000 samples and I was feeling really good about myself, thinking like, hey, I got this really cool malware feed where I, can, like, where I have definitive proof that smoke loader is delivering X malware at this time with this affiliate ID. But really only 2,500 of those were valid PE files and I just did not parse the results properly. A good chunk of them were HTML files and like uh, 403 responses, so that was my bad. Um, but I, for all the PE files that I actually got, I submitted them to the hatching triage uh, sandbox, and if it was able to classify it as X, Y, or Z malware family, then I kept a record of it in that CSV. Um, so some of the most significant results I got from this work, um, I apparently got 614 deja vu samples, which for those that don't know, it's a uh, ransomware written in Go, but I think the signatures for this aren't very good. Um, Go binaries are quite large in nature, and I've seen quite a few false positives with deja vu in the past, so that might need fu uh, future exploration. And then we have Archive and Redline, which are kind of your standard info stealers, your run-of-the-mill info stealers. Uh, but what's interesting here is we have smoke loader delivering smoke loader, which is that first bar there. So that's kind of like this weird recursive system where smoke loader admins are paying other smoke loader admins to deliver their own uh, smoke loader. So you have this like weird recursive system of smoke loader uh, delivering smoke loader. Uh, but then some other interesting ones here is we have Iced ID and Gozi or ISFB, however you feel like calling that. And those are kind of uh, two more mature malware operations where they don't really have to rely on this selling loads model. Like they can, they have their own ways of sending mal spam and uh, they don't have to put all their effort into this, which I thought was kind of interesting that they then were using this selling loads model to load their malware, but who am I? Um, and then also there was Tofsi, which for those that don't know, Tofsi is a spam botnet. Um, and so it was kind of this other case where like you have smoke loader distributing malware which then delivers Topsy, which then sends more malware. So it's just like these hosts get so mangled and just have so much malware running on them that they, I'm sure that, the, uh, that they aren't running very well. So some additional observations. Um, when I started this and set up the bot, I was not able to properly extract the affiliate ID. Um, so I, kinda, I, knew, I knew that there were some main ones, and in that case it's pub one, pub two, and pub five. I think there's a pub four. Uh, and maybe a pub three in there even, but I had it hard coded to these so we can kind of see that pub one is the most active one. So maybe in the future I would like to figure out why that one, why I, I got the most payloads there. So some reflections from this work. I was pretty bummed that a good chunk of the results that I was saving to disk weren't valid PE files. I think if I actually looked at my data throughout this process and saw that a good chunk of it weren't valid, I maybe would have done better work to make my bots more believable. Um, and I would have added more IP rotation to the setup because within Smoke Loader in the panel, you can actually say like, I want this payload to go to bots in this geolocation. Um, and for the longest time, since 2020 actually, that was the only, ver that, that was the latest version that was out. But then three months ago, they actually came out with version 2022, which I was not aware of. Um, so most of this work was done with 2020, but I tried my bot against the 2020 version of the panel and it works fine, so they don't have a network or a protocol update, it seems to be just plugin related. Um, and I would like to properly reverse engineer the plugins just to see that they actually are doing what they're advertised as doing. Um, I need to look into the affiliate IDs and how they're extracted. Um, the way that I know to extract them is to read the last four bytes of, sta of the initial stage, but that does not work for all the samples, so I need to figure out for those samples where it doesn't work, how that is actually implemented. Um, and right now, the unicorn component basically reads the entire like 
legitimate smoke loader sample. It doesn't execute any of the other functions, but it just feels weird basically having my software development product rely on uh, a legitimate smoke loader sample. So some additional resources. Um, I did most of my analysis just kind of with my own reverse engineering experience. Um, here are some cases where other people reverse engineered smoke loader. They might have different results. Um, open analysis recently did a fantastic, I think, three or four part series on analyzing smoke loader. So I definitely recommend checking that out if you're interested. And then Nightwolf and CertPL put out good resources on smoke loader that go over the obfuscation techniques and some of the other things that I didn't cover. Um, so what will I be releasing from all this? Um, I'm going to be putting up somewhere all the malware samples that I actually got. So if people are interested in, in investigating this botnet, they can go and take that data set and maybe find inferences that I couldn't come up with. Happy to share my IDA analysis files if people are, are interested. Uh, the slides for the talk and then that config extraction tool that I wrote. Uh, I'll be open sourcing that here. I just have to actually remove that valid smoke loader sample and just strip it down to its uh, to, to, to just the decompression code. And then finally, a CSV containing all of the uh, results that I, that I got throughout this eight month period. So yeah, thank you. I guess if people have questions, happy to take those. question about the payloads. If yeah. you delivered Ollie debugger as a payload and ran it, would it disable the mount, the, the botnet? Yeah, That's I mean, you, you, would, you would have to tell the debugger kind of how to initialize it to debug itself. But yeah, I mean, you definitely could like just start up a pro you wouldn't even actually have to deliver Ollie debug. Like it just checks by the, the name. by the executable name. So if you want to like, you get access to a smoke loader panel, you can go and push tasks and cause all the bots to shut down. Totally viable. Wouldn't recommend it, but you know, up to you. Um, so during your career of you know reverse engineering, were uh, were you at any point uh, able to trace back to the command center uh, where it was hosted? Is it maybe in like a major cloud provider like uh, Azure, AWS, GCP, stuff like that? And if you did, uh, what were the, those cloud cloud providers' response? Um, so I looked into some of these command and control servers a couple months ago. They're at like kind of shadier hosting providers. Um, so if you send them a request that, hey, you have like a valid C2 panel, they'll ignore you. Uh, that's generally how it works for some of these shadier places. Um, but I forgot to mention, but the actual like 2018 version of Smoke Loader, the panel was leaked. So if anyone wants to go look at like what a C2 panel looks like for a like enterprise grade malware operation, you can go and do that. That's actually how I set up my own command and control server for it. Any final questions? All righty. Well, thank you all. I definitely appreciate you all letting me present to you.